and good to see you all here today. When I got up, it was about 16 degrees out where I live. But if you ever lived or spent any time in the northern tier of Pennsylvania, which some of you have, if you waited for a good day to do anything, you wouldn't do anything at all. So here we are. Good to see you. We will uh, be online later on this afternoon. So hello to the folks who will be watching online. The youth group meets tonight at 6. Okay. And the bell choir will meet again this Wednesday at 7. And Jan has a little announcement too. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted you all to be aware that the session has been kind enough to approve the use of the social room um, about, we're hoping, one Sunday a month for a new support group for caregivers that are dealing with elderly parents or not necessarily elderly, but family members that are experiencing cognitive issues. So if you know of anyone or if you are dealing with that, please, you are welcome to attend. Our first meeting is today. I know that's short notice, but today at 2 o'clock. Uh, we are obeying the sanitizing program that needs to be, so we'll all be safe. Uh, masks are required. And if you have any questions, let me know. Give me a call, text me, whatever you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And um, the strength in our core program is still available. And all it is is that you would uh, be assigned somebody from the church to call once a week, someone who's pretty much a shut-in. Uh, and then we ask that you'd reach out to somebody in the community. And as I get out and about, what I recognize is that there's a, there's a lot of grief and sadness. There's a lot of frustration and even anger that's come from the last uh, 10 months plus, we're almost into 11 months now with this pandemic, and holding on and keeping together is important, and uh, when you uh, receive a call or card or a note or someone checks in on you, uh, or you give, give them a call, then it just makes a big difference and brightens people's day. So um, we're ready to go to worship. Nice to have uh, Zach at the organ, so thanks for being here this morning, and uh, let us worship the Lord. to worship. God is our rock and my salvation, my fortress. We shall never be shaken. Our hope is from God, our mighty rock and refuge. So we trust in the Lord at all times, for power belongs to our creator God, and steadfast love comes from the Lord. Let us worship God together. The opening prayer. Please bow your heads. Today we hear your call. Lord Jesus, to follow you. You ask us simply to trust in your amazing way 
to provide all we need and to lay aside our thought that we might know better than you do. You are Lord of time and eternity and everything in between. Therefore, we gather to worship, to hear and to follow you in this world that needs your good news. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood Support me in the overwhelming flood When all around my soul gives way Then it is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand. Prayer of Confession Forgiving God, you have known us through the ages long. You have called to us, but we do not listen. You have shown us your path, but we prefer our own way. You have desired what is best for us, but we seek what is best for ourselves, even when it harms others. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you, that we might ever be agents of mercy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Though so much changes in the world around us, God is steadfast and can be counted on to preserve and protect us always. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. invite the children forward for their message. Good morning, friends. How are you? Quiet bunch today. All right. Has anyone ever seen this movie? Yes. You have.
one time it was this movie. How exciting. All right. So, I haven't watched it from a really long, for a really long time, probably since I was your age. But today I was just looking at a few clips from it. I want you to listen to this part quickly. that in the beginning? Anybody catch what they were singing? Following the leader. Following the leader. That's right. That's right. Have you ever played that game? Who here has played that game? You have? Do you want to tell your friends that haven't played? How do you how do you do well at that game? What do you have to do? So if you're the leader, right, you can do whatever you want. And the other people have to follow you in a line and do that. It's kind of like Simon Says. If you haven't played Follow the Leader, I bet you've played Simon Says, right? And they're both really fun. And to be good at them, you have to follow the person that's being the leader at that time, right? And you have to be a really good listener, and you have to pay attention if you want to do well at that game. Let's listen to today's scripture. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Mark 1 verses 16 through 18. So remember the song? We're following the leader, the leader, the leader. We're following the leader wherever he may go. So that's a great game. But in our daily lives, we follow the leader all the time. Right? In school, in church, in our sports, there's always a leader in any activity we're in. And every day we have to decide which leader we will follow. And we have to be sure to choose a leader that will lead us in the right direction. Remember the scripture? He saw two fishermen who were throwing their fishing nets out into the sea. Jesus called out to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The Bible tells us that they laid down their nets and followed Jesus. Jesus went a little farther and he saw two more men, James and John, sitting in their boat, mending their nets. Jesus called out to them and the Bible tells us they left their boat and followed Jesus. So Jesus is still calling people to follow him today. He has called you and me and now it's our time to decide which leader are we going to follow. Think about that as you go out to your class today, to school tomorrow, to maybe some sports this week, all right? And hopefully, Jesus is your leader. Let's pray. You have called us to follow you. May we always choose you as our leader and say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you may lead. Amen. First scripture reading is Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in his lies. With their mouths they bless but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Low-born men are but a breath. The highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. 
One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard. That you, O God, are strong, and that you, O Lord, are loving. Surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. The word of the Lord. The solo I'm going to sing this morning is entitled For God Alone, which is based on Psalm 62. I wrote this piece in 1986 at the request of a soprano soloist at National Presbyterian Church, who basically handed me a bullet and said, here, I want you to write me a solo, <laughs> so, which I did. Uh, and in the translation I had, the, the first line is, for God alone my soul waits in silence. And it struck me as I was challenged to try to set the, uh, the words of the 62nd Psalm, how difficult it is for us to wait in silence. Have you ever tried the exercise where you sit and listen for God's voice, try to empty your mind, and these things just, <laughs> before you know it, you're thinking about all sorts of things. And it seems to me, at least in the translation I had, that maybe the psalm writer had that same issue, otherwise it would have been a very short psalm. <laughs> So you'll hear that in the structure of the piece. You'll hear this quiet opening that will return as you kind of, as we take ourselves and quiet ourselves back to listening to God, for God alone. <clears throat> for God alone, my soul waits in silence. <clears throat> From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. He only is my rock and my salvation. I shall not be greatly moved. For God alone my soul waits in silence. <clears throat> For my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. My hope is from Him. I shall not be shaken. Trust in Him at all times, O oh people, trust in Him. <clears throat> Pour out your heart before Him. Pour out your heart before Him. Pour out your heart before the Lord. For God is a refuge for us, our source of strength, our shelter from above. God is our refuge for us. He is our hope, our guardian of love. 
my deliverance and my own Lord. my mighty rock my refuge is Together since 19, since not 19, but since 2016. I'm always grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel, which is found in the 14th chapter, I'm sorry, the first chapter of Mark, the 14th and 20th verses. Listen for the word of the Lord. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them and left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may would you join me in prayer. So gracious Lord, help us to hear and understand these words, but that you get deep inside us, that we may know what it means a little more clearly to follow you. I ask your blessing as we hear and understand these words in Christ. Amen. So a theology professor always told his students, you get into trouble, give me a call, or just keep in touch. I love hearing from you, and very few people ever did that. But one day, one of his newly minted uh, former students, who's now a pastor, called and said, I have a problem. So what's your problem? He said, how do you fire a volunteer? Okay, so he asked this rookie pastor, what do you mean? So, well, there's this widow who comes in just about every day. She sweeps the hallway with a straw broom. She's mean, she's rude, and actually, she doesn't do a very good job. And I don't know how to get rid of her. So he said, well, maybe there's a reason that she wants to be there every day. Why don't you just ask what it is? And once you know, why don't you give her some grace? Okay. The next week, this rookie pastor calls his old theology prof. He said, so I did it. I went up to her. And I asked, why do you spend so much time at church when you're so miserable doing it? And he said, she told me. What'd she say? He said, well, 40 years ago, I cheated on my husband with another man. And 12 years ago, he died. And he never knew that I had betrayed him. But I've been feeling miserable my whole life. So I sweep these rooms. I sweep this hallway. So I did what you told me to do, his former student said to his professor. He said, I looked at her and I said, in the name of Jesus and in his authority, I absolve you from all your sins and you are forgiven. And as soon as I did that, her whole face changed, he said. Well, what happened? She said, I've been here Sunday after Sunday, week after week, day after day for years with this God-forsaken broom. I've just been waiting for here to, for someone to tell me this stuff. He said, well, amen, good. And he said, it gets better. Okay, what happened? He said, no sooner had she told me that she's been waiting to hear some good news in her life, she threw the broom into the corner of the hallway, and she said, I don't have to do this anymore, and walked out. But she walked out free. And there's grace to that, which 
is very hard for us to understand because we think we have to work our way into this. But it's free. Now Jesus never meant the good news to create a sense of guilt or for you to carry a burden of all of that on your back, to have some sort of religious obligation. And if that was his message, that would hardly be good news for anybody. What he means to do is really set us free and give us a whole new way of being human. Now, of course, every story in the Bible has its original context. And then it has a history where it finally meets us in our context. So in Mark's gospel and for his community, what Jesus is doing is sharing that the rituals, the obligations, the observances really didn't help people get closer to God. Instead, it became something that was drudgery, it was lifeless. It was devoid of spirit, leaving them empty and frustrated and actually angry, just like this woman who was sleep, sweeping hallways for years. Now, if you would be in that time and try to understand what was going on, a lot of it was social and a lot of it was economic. The people who opposed the system were likely to be arrested. They might be jailed, beaten, and maybe even executed. They would certainly be put down, and the strong arm of the law came in two ways. It came from their own people, and of course it came from the Romans. So we know that John the Baptist actually stuck his head up above and called them out and eventually lost his head for it. Because leaders are usually invested in keeping things to their favor. So, keeping things the same was certainly the order of the day. And someone like Jesus coming in and changing the order was not going to be very welcome. But what Jesus was doing was showing us God's way to be human beings. You and I understand this. We are born into a world that is primarily physical. We need material things to keep us together. You need to eat. You need to have clothing. You need to uh, have a living. You need to supply what you need to for uh, your power, your light, your car insurance, uh, and, and even though the people who call you and tell you they can help you with your car warranty might be helpful, but they still just want the money, right? But that leads to a restless drive to acquire things, to satisfy our needs and our, and our wants and our longings. And it also leads to a permanent state of competition, that we're always competing to get ahead. Now that competition can just be harmless or it can also lead to a lot of violence which leads to endless cycles of pain and suffering which we know about. The people of the first century were no different from us. They were doing the same thing. But this life is not simply a restless drive to acquire and get ahead. And so that meme that says those who die with the most toy wins, that's wrong, absolutely wrong. Now, for the people of the first century, a huge symbol of this drive for acquisition was the Roman army. It was bolstered in Israel by many people who cooperated with them because they could get ahead that way and they could acquire and they could have a little bit more up over their neighbor or friends. And a lot of people thought they were acquiring more than what was due them. What the prophets of old knew, what John the baptizer knew, was that material goods, along with power and status and position, really do not make you feel whole and healthy and well. They don't make you feel happy, and in fact, holding on to them robs you of your humanity. Because the consequence is that enough is never enough. Now, if anybody's downsized, if you live in Quincy, you've downsized. <laughs> and we downsized almost two years ago. How many of you downsized? And to move to a smaller place. You know, you just finally say, I don't need all of this. That's a healthy thing. When enough is never enough, you just acquire and acquire and acquire. I have walked into houses that were, you, you could say the people really had that TV show about hoarding down. They really did. The problem is that all of that just leads to dehumanizing. It dehumanizes people who are made in God, God's image. It dehumanizes ourselves. Because we are not just material. We are body, but we are mind and spirit. We're gifts of God who breathed into us the divine breath. 
that God has given dignity to each person, we're not meant to compete. We're actually meant to cooperate, to change the world for the better. Except we've proven ourselves unable to do that because fear takes over. And where fear takes over, then there is untruth and there's violence and there's pain and all of that comes into that three-letter word called sin. And what we've discovered is that we are really unable to make the world better on our own. We're unable to make the world better apart from God's help. But that's where Jesus begins to share the good news. Because the good news is that Jesus is showing us a better way how to live. Where that old dreary way of living insists that we just matter. And there's no other purpose except to be consumers at the cost of competition and violence and ultimately death. There's a new story. And that's what Jesus was saying, turn around and believe. That it first of all sees that God is God and God has made everything with a purpose and God has made everything in love. That life is meaningful and eternal and that we are woven together into a fabric that is meant to be filled with the love of God. That all creation is to be alive with the glory of God, especially the human creation. And as we cooperate instead of compete, we find that there's enough for everyone. And everyone's life is valued. Jesus wasn't just feeding the 5,000 several times over because that was a nice trick. He was demonstrating that when you put God first, there's enough for everybody. And that everybody's life has the dignity that God intended. And the world then reflects the glory of God. We recover the original design of tilling the garden and making it fruitful and walking with God in peace at the cool of the day. So when Jesus called these fishermen by the shores of the Galilee, he wasn't asking them, now let's step up your religious practices and get some good discipline going on here. And let's do some work on the morals and language and bad habits of our neighbors and let them know we mean business. That had nothing to do with it. He's inviting them to a new way of living, to see the world as charged with the glory of God. And they caught a glimpse of it, these 12 men. And not just them, but so many who followed. And they may not have fully realized what was going on, even after the cross. It took a long time. But it captured their imaginations, enough for them to drop their nets and follow Jesus. And what those fishermen did was odd to us, but it was not odd to them. Because if someone offered you this whole new way of living, when you've been living a life that has no consequence, except you're a cog in someone else's machinery, and it's never going to do you any good, why would you not drop everything to follow Jesus? I know in our day, being a follower of Jesus is considered very odd, antiquated, old-fashioned, all that other stuff, because everyone is so totally bought into a material world and that we fear giving it up. And what happens is it's enslaved us. Some people just go to buy things to buy things. There's a, an exchange that happens when you buy things. A lot of people use credit cards to buy things, forgetting that eventually the credit card bill comes in the mail. But it feels so good to buy things which is why things like bankruptcy has really become a deal, a big deal. It's also a very difficult thing for us to talk to our friends about our spiritual life, to talk to them about our belief in Christ. They feel that we're pushy or that we're being judgmental or something like that. It's even more difficult that a whole portion of the church has sold itself out to this whole myth that we should have power and we should be acquiring things. And they fear that if we don't do that, we'll lose out. They claim to love the Lord with all their soul, and yet they hate their neighbor with all their heart. Does that make any sense? They've not understood the love of God for this whole world, nor do they see that faith has to work through love. And a lot of the church has sold its birthright of freedom out for a way that will never set them free or anyone else. That's why it's so hard to talk to people. People see through all of that. 
So into this reality and into our reality now, Jesus comes with this message that there is another way of living, a way that lives in love towards God and towards neighbor, a way of living that does not make acquiring things your highest good or your goal, but it sees the world charged with the glory of God and sees God's majesty and sees God's dignity in every face. It doesn't fear people. It doesn't shun our neighbor. It asks us to love with the love of Christ and to look at people as people made in the image of God, whether or not they look like us, agree with us, act like us, have our values. We all come from God. And this is a way of living that seeks the good of our neighbors, even above ourselves. It's a way of making the world whole instead of fragmenting it. So yes, this is really good news. There's a whole other way to live. And so Jesus walked along the shoreline of the Galilee and he invited the least likely people to follow him. And they did. And with them, Jesus changed the world. But he meets with us today. And we hear the story of a good news in the power and spirit of the resurrection. And he walks along the shoreline of our times and he looks to you and me, the least likely of people. And he asks the same question. Will you follow me? Amen. Well, I invite you to this time of prayer. And in our prayers, I ask you to remember Bud and June and Carol, uh, Roger and Jean, who had some surgery this week in his home, Denver, uh, who was in the hospital this morning, uh, John, Alvaret. Providence Place, our oldest member. Uh, Alan, a friend of mine who had a double lung transplant, he's at Johns Hopkins and hopes to be home by um, Valentine's Day. He's been in since early December. Uh, also, Jerry, I ask you to remember uh, certainly those who wear the uniform of our country, young men and women. Uh, they even come from this church, of course. Um, certainly those who are incarcerated, whom no one prays for and no one cares about. And I think we need to care. And are there others that you'd like to make mention of? Brian? Okay. And um, are schools going back in this week? Or they've been in? This week? They've been in? Well, you need to remember those kids and teachers and you know, the lunch ladies too. So, okay. Let's go before God in the time of prayer. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, you don't want holy words. You don't want holy attitudes. You don't want us to pretend. You just want us to be real with you. And so here we are. You know us. You know the good, the bad, the ugly all about us. We've already prayed our prayer of confession. And we've been reminded that we are loved and set free and forgiven. Help us to live out that message and to see our lives shining with your glory. Maybe not fully now, but you know what we will become. That one day we will shine with your glory fully alive. We ask your help and blessing to work towards that now and set us free to be able to love God and neighbor and ourselves, sometimes the hardest people to love. There are many needs around us and in each of these needs, you call us to meet some. We can't meet all, but we can meet some. I know the line of human need never ends. We don't have to meet the whole thing, but point us in the direction where we can make somebody's day or week better. We thank you for all of those in the healthcare industry who are working so hard. And we're grateful for the vaccines that are coming and, and for many who've already had it and many more to come. We ask your help and blessing with our teachers and students and the staff of our schools. If you guide those young men and women who wear the uniform of our country and whom we put in places of harm and danger, we ask you to give us eyes to see this community differently. That we could see it as a community where you love each person here and want us to live together in such a way that it builds one another up. 
We pray for your help and blessing to overcome the things that trouble us so much, the divisions, the racism, the things that divide us, and that we can be people who actually build bridges of grace and of peace and of truth. So guide us. We know that you hear everything we pray, and even the things we cannot fully share or speak because we don't know how to do it, but you know the prayers of our heart. So teach us. And pray into us your prayers for a world alive with you. We ask this in the name of the one who teaches us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grant, O oh Lord, we pray, that the words we have said and sung this day may be so rooted and nurtured in our hearts that our lives may bring forth good fruit and our lips may show forth thy praise to the honor and glory of thy holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Zach. And please remain seated for Zach's post duties. He's worked very hard on it. As you go forth through this week, throw away that broom of obligation. Go out there and learn how to love people and let God love you. And may the love of God and the fellowship of Jesus and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.